Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on the September 13th, 2016 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can listen to my show every evening, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's Pacific Time. They play the show at 11 a.m. as well. And if you can't get it there, uh, well, let me. don't forget, I, I'm on about four or five different AM stations in the south. And um, uh, you can go to my website to find out where those are. But anyway... Uh, you can go to Arctic Beacon, that's A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N.com, and you can get shows going back over 10 years regarding the Vatican-led New World Order. My guest today is uh, Attorney John Levy, and John's been on my show many times, and one of the more interesting cases he's taken on in his life, one of the few attorneys, by the way, that uh, takes on the Vatican and all their financial uh, uh, shenanigans, so to speak. John's been working on a case for more than a decade regarding, uh, it was called Alpern v. Vatican Bank here in the States, but it's got uh, new legs now, and John uh, would like to talk about that. John, what's going on now with the Vatican and that case? Right, thank you for the lead in. Um, well, i got to tell you, there's been some new development in the case against the Vatican and the Vatican Bank regarding... Um, our claim, which had to do with uh, money from former Yugoslavia and other parts of Eastern Europe that were laundered through the Vatican Bank after the Second World War, and a lot of that was victim gold from concentration camps in Yugoslavia, looted property, and we, we've been after the Vatican, as you know, for oh, since 1999, chasing them through U.S. courts, uh, through the European Union structure, and now through a canon law petition uh, to Pope Francis, and what we've been asking for is for the Vatican to account for that money that went into the Vatican Bank. It doesn't belong to them. It was stolen, and we have witnesses. We, it's a historic fact. The money was deposited there, and everyone more or less agrees with that, so it's not some fantasy or hypothetical thing, but uh, it's residing with the Vatican, and uh, there's been some a, a major development regarding Vatican finances recently, which I, I think you as, a, mm-hmm. as an astute uh, expert on the church might, might agree is very important. Yeah, and uh, can you, you know, is there any ever chance to getting any uh, money out of them and justice in this case, or are they going to stonewall it forever? No, I, I do think that eventually the Vatican will see the light. And as you know, when we talk about the Vatican, it has, you know, people think that the Pope runs the show. And and he does to some extent, but we also know that there's various factions inside the Vatican who are powers onto themselves. So what's happened recently was the Vatican brought in Cardinal Pell from Australia. And mind you, his major achievement in Australia was covering up and minimizing sexual abuse scandal there children. But nonetheless, he brought Pell to uh, the Vatican a couple of years ago as sort of a finance czar to clean things up, or, or as, as I've alleged, to cover things up better, since really Pell's main expertise is covering things up, not cleaning them. But I guess you could call him a cleaner, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Pell's gone in there, and he, he has kicked over a few, you know, ant hills and closed some accounts at the Vatican Bank, mainly belonging to people who are not well connected to the current Pope. That is, he went after uh, accounts belonging to the historic nobility, the Colonnas and uh, the Orsini families in particular, who had long been a noble family connected with the Roman states. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they make up a, a number of the uh, non-clerical positions at the Vatican, as well as clerical, you know, princes of the church. And, uh, you know, the Argentinian Francis went after these guys. He closed their accounts, made a lot of enemies, but really didn't get to the heart of the matter, which was the massive money laundering that the Vatican Bank and the Vatican itself has been used for um, during the Second World War and after the Second World War. So Pell did make some enemies and... um, the, the most significant matter is he's now been sidelined. Apparently this faction that is against Pell has forced him out of there as far as being an effective finance czar. And some of the headlines back last week were saying as such that the audits that Pell had promised of the Vatican Bank and of the uh, 
apostolic uh, uh, treasury, um, ap- apostolic patrimony of the Holy See, known as APSA, another sort of Vatican Bank. You know, there's more than one Vatican Bank in the Vatican. People don't know that. It's at least two, maybe three. And uh, those audits were put on hold. So we see that as very significant. Now, do you think that the money laundering, you're talking about a case in World War II, but is it still going on today, or or have they had to change their M.O.? Yeah, well, and partially as a result of our case, and the fact we went to the European Union and complained about the Vatican, because the Vatican uses the euro, and therefore is part of the eurozone, the Vatican did have to bring in a financial intelligence unit, um, under, uh, under a fellow by the name of Rene Brulhart from Liechtenstein. And again, it's a n- nothing but a cover-up unit. They, they issue some worthless report once a year, say, yes, they investigated hundreds of instances of money laundering. But, of course, what, what comes of it is really nothing. So they, they are under EU regulations. They're supposed to clean up their act. Uh, money Val, which is a, a, another European institution, had them, uh, you know, on probation for a while, but all in all, by going through all this rigmarole and pretending to do stuff, and putting on the dog and pony show, the Vatican Bank has managed to keep its status as a as a banking institution, so it can still move money around, and it moves a lot of money around, stolen money, and a lot of the money still there is stolen money. I so they are still the Vatican, but they still, are still laundering money. Then it's just harder to. That's, Find That's it. the business of the Vatican Bank is to launder money. Okay. Now, here's a question that uh, I ne- never get a great answer, but you being one that's delved into their finances, which is enormous, ten, a number of years ago when I was in Rome seeing the Vatican Bank scandal close up, that was back in the 80s, I came back and even 10 years ago here I made statements that the Vatican is the richest institution in the world and people will come back and say to me, oh, they're just, they, look, they're, they used to be, but they don't have that much money. How much money do you, is there any way to put a finger on it? And is that statement I made uh, close to being true, that they are the richest organization? There's no question. But now, of course, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, puts out a fake audit every year showing that they have something like $27 million. And they just barely run it break even. That's a lie. Um, the, the, the reason the reason is is what are you counting? Are you counting just one account at the Vatican, or do we count the wealth of the entire Catholic Church, which includes what all these orders, right? Mm-hmm. All the Catholic in, all the Catholic charities, all the Catholic universities. Which ultimately, the fact is, Georgetown University, to name one of the premier uh, Catholic universities in the U.S. Ultimately, who do they have to answer to? <laughs> Yeah. That's the answer to the Pope. The Pope tells the rector of Georgetown University, you're going to uh, put this class instead of that class. What's the rector going to do? He's going to do what the Pope says. The Pope controls these things. That is one of the strategies of the church that they put into effect about 400 years ago, which was when when, uh, their, when their properties started getting seized in Europe. Right. Um, they started trying to move it around. For example, what is the most fabulous lost treasure in the U.S.? Well, the treasure of the Jesuits, mm-hmm. um, who, who the Mexican government, uh, when it became independent from Spain, they went after what? The, the uh, property of the Catholic Church. And uh, fabulous amounts of wealth um, were hidden away and still are. So that the churches had seizures like that occur to it over the years. So they're very, very careful about where they hide their assets. And their strategy is, well, we don't hide it. Let's not put it all in one pot. Let's put it in a million pots. Hmm. And that's what they do. So when, when you add that up, but, but just to give you some idea of the immense wealth, well, Georgetown University, again, I hate to pick on them, but they sit on some of the most valuable real estate in the world, correct? Right. Downtown Washington. What do you think that real estate's worth? <laughs> I, I, uh, I couldn't get a fabulous amount of money, and you add to that, to that all the other Catholic universities around the world sitting on valuable property. What is that worth? What is it? What is the, a church worth? Right? The Vatican, by the way, doesn't count those um, as property. But but some of these cathedrals. What is Notre Dame Cathedral worth? Right? 
Well, we can't put a price. Priceless. Well, everything's got a price. What What is the Vatican uh, Museum worth? Well, 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 that belongs to everybody. We can't put a price on that. Oh, it belongs to everybody, does it? No, it belongs to the Pope and the Catholic Church. So the, the amount of wealth that these guys have managed to accumulate over the past 2,000 years, think of that, mm-hmm. the world's oldest, at least oldest n- non-secret organization, right, mm-hmm. is... Uh, it's been accumulating wealth for 2,000 years. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, your case, the Alpern v. Vatican Bank case that we covered for you, I covered for years, the one thing I was left with was this argument that they, uh, that even our judicial system agreed upon was the fact that they don't do business here. Our courts have even said that. So you, you have no right to sue them. I, I just shook my head and I say, how could they, in their... You know, how can a judge look himself in the mirror when he says that? And all you were asking for was justice for people who lost their loved ones when it was proven the Vatican had not only been responsible for that genocide, partially responsible, but had had pilfered money and gold from these people. And then the American courts have the audacity to say they don't do business here. How, how, How did you ever resolve that? Uh, with anyone well, as, a, the, I mean, as, as a lawyer I'm going to tell you the judicial system's rigged mm-hmm. we have what five Catholics on the Supreme Court right or is it six five I guess, I guess it's four now that Thomas died mm-hmm. or no was it Thomas so who died Scalia Scalia, Scalia. yeah Scalia died because okay, so now there's only four out of eight justices are Catholics so um, what, what is that I mean are you, 50% you know before that, we had five out of nine. So, what are you telling me? Sixty percent of the U.S. population is Catholic. No, but Catholics control the Supreme Court. Um, any anything against the Catholic Church is therefore doomed. What other cases are going on now in the states uh, that really shows how they? Are? I know there was a case in the South regarding how they were pilfering and stealing uh, insurance money from people. You, and you keep a pretty close eye on them. Are there any big cases still going on against the Vatican well, that, here? That one just kind of disappeared and got thrown out of the courts. It may have been quietly settled. It was the uh, Martin Frankel case. Um, a lot of people have forgotten about him, but he was like a, a major, major scammer in the 1990s. And uh, he looted several insurance companies throughout the United States, set up a phony Catholic foundation, even though he wasn't Catholic, he was Jewish, and laundered the money through the Vatican Bank with the help of some minor officials over there. So, um, and there was even a money. there was even a bishop or something that one or a priest that went on record stating that they took a percentage, right? Yes, that was I think it was Monsignor Cola Giovanni. All oh, right, probation. Yes, yeah. yeah, he got probation. Because uh, he was too old, you see, to put in jail here. Frankel, of course, got the book thrown at him, and he's still in prison. But uh, it was huge. It was maybe a billion dollars was laundered through the Vatican Bank. All money looted from U.S. insurance companies. Uh, five insurance state insurance commissioners sued the Vatican Bank, and the case just kind of disappeared. We we think it may have been settled, or <laughs> or more likely, I think they were the insurance commissioners who are, after all, politicians. We're, we're quietly told to cease and desist. And that's where these cases really go. You never really uh, hear about them anymore. I mean, there's probably many others that just never even get well, brought was, into the courts. There was a big case against, uh, where, where I remember uh, Pope Benedict was subpoenaed. Mm-hmm. He's down in Texas. That was over that uh, uh, doctrine that uh, Benedict developed when he was, uh, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger of mm-hmm. the, the Doctrine of the Holy Faith, the Congregation Doctrine of the Holy Faith, uh, that, what was it called, the, Rat, the Ratzinger Memo or whatever it was, telling churches to lie and cover up sexual abuse. So he was uh, subpoenaed into a Texas court, and uh, again, that, that was quashed. That nothing, nothing, nothing came of it. Nothing happened. You, you know, know, I want to get... You can't subpoena the Pope, right? You can't do it. Why can't you? What's the, legal, well, what's the legality there? there? Court said you can't. That he gave the Pope, you can't subpoena. But even even if it's for something the Pope did before he was the Pope, they agreed. Ratzinger did this uh, doctrine to cover up sexual abuse, and they managed to cover it up for ten years um, before the scandal finally got too big for the Catholic Church to contain. Nonetheless, 
they, they, by covering it up, they only ended up paying a few of the claims. Hey, do me a favor. Uh, but, remind me in the next half hour to talk about the Ukraine and some things you want to talk about. But I want to I want to get into something here that's interesting. Uh, the elections are going. You're a you're a political science teacher. People may not know over at what is it Southern New Hampshire University. Yeah, I'm on, on the political science faculty at Southern New Hampshire University. I hold a PhD in political science. Well, you know something. One of the things I've always uh, wondered about. In all of the scenarios we see, all of the narratives we hear from both the Republicans and Democrats, uh, we hear this, uh, we, we just talked about the Pope is never, the Catholic Church is never held liable for anything. And that, to me, if we look at Hillary Clinton's life, it seems that she is basically gets the same kind of protection as the Pope almost. And I, I like to make that analogy because if you look at this election, I've never seen anything like it. There, the crimes that are so obvious that she has committed regarding our national security, regarding uh, being even told as a as a lawyer, you, you know this. The, the FBI even said she was extremely reckless. The statute says all you have to have is gross negligence, but then the FBI says, well, you know, there's no prosecutor would bring this case. I, I disagree with that, and I know you must. This is to, to me where the problem is. Talk about that. The normal procedure on something like that with a controversial case would be to take it to a grand jury. Therefore, the prosecutor doesn't decide. The grand jury would decide whether to indict her. So a federal grand jury should have been convened. We saw that happen with some figures in the Reagan administration. And, and I think during the uh, Bill Clinton administration. So they haven't been shy about convening grand juries in the past when they have a case that's too hot to handle. Um, however, that, that didn't occur, did it? And that wasn't even an option, apparently, um, because uh, Lynch, the attorney general, uh, you know, killed the case right there. It was never going to go anywhere. Well, it appears like our Justice Department and our FBI are strictly now just a political arm of the Obama administration. And there's a one set of justice for her, for, the, for Clinton, and another for everybody else. What's your thoughts on that? I know the Republicans have been beating that drum, but... Well, at the risk of sounding like a deplorable, right? <laughs> yeah. The deplorables that Hillary Clinton talked about. Let's, let's look at Attorney General. We, we've had uh, Eric Holder, now Ms. Lynch there. Are these the best qualified people for that job? Uh, probably not, but they're, they're Obama loyalists. So that, that's, they're going to do whatever is perceived as you know, good for Obama who has endorsed Hillary and has said that Trump is a danger, mm -hmm. a, a clear and present danger in his unfit broth. So they're, they're going to tow the party line. And likewise, we have a fellow there at Department of Homeland Security, another another Obama appointee. I mean, Congress is the one who really holds the uh, bag here for letting these you know, political hacks get in there. Yeah, they so, approved it, right? Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, Congress, it's all a fix. Um, so the, the system is pretty fixed. So I'm, I'm not surprised that, that Hillary Clinton would have impunity for alleged crimes. Now, what's the story about, you know, another thing really talking about Hillary Clinton since we're on the subject and it's election time and people are interested in all this. What's your take on this, the, her health issue? To me, it appears she has something more than just pneumonia. I mean, uh, if you look at her... She's not on the campaign trail. She's collapsed a number of times. In a couple of videos, you see her almost acting as if she's having a seizure or spasms. It doesn't look to me to be just a simple case. Now, pneumonia can be serious, but uh, what's your take on this? Is uh, they, Are they hiding something so big and just trying to push a corpse into the White House, or what? what's going on? Yeah, it, it is a major... Well, I think everybody has realized by now, thanks to the Internet, um, who's viewed that uh, latest video of her being loaded into the van. Mm -hmm. And I, I sent you a clip where someone has actually seen some metal cylindrical object fall out of her pants leg, too. Yeah, I just watched that. Yeah, go ahead. In the van that they're not discussing in the media very much. You can barely find it anymore, but, but that happened, too. But, you know, clearly there's something wrong with her, uh, fairly serious. And uh, everybody knows it. And, in fact, if you look at, you know, some of the biggest pro or, yeah, I should say, anti-Trump media out there, like the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or New York Times, they, they all but admit, they say, well, Hillary is a serial liar, but you got to understand that, you know, poor Hillary, you know, the, the 
everyone's been after her for so long, she doesn't trust the press. So when you ask her a question, she just defaults to lying. But 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 mind you, those are small lies, and Trump's the big liar. So that, that's that's the official line now. So she lies about everything, but that's okay because uh, Trump is unfit for office. That that will, <laughs> that the ends justify the means, Greg. Yeah, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, when you look at what's going on in this election, uh, the one the one fact that I wanted to open this door that never seems to get open regarding the Vatican and their political clout behind the scenes. And one of the door on how to how I was thinking of doing this was just recently. I've never seen this before. Uh, well, Trump he appears on the Alex Jones show. Infowars, which shocked me in a sense. Uh, then, when I was watching a Clinton speech, she referred to this conspiracy and Trump being on Alex Jones, and they're they're opening this door where you're seeing it never opened before in the internet. Now, I don't have much faith in Alex Jones, as you know, and uh, it leads me to the question. If Alex Jones has recently, I mean, 10 years ago, he called me crazy for even talking about the Vatican, but he's gone on record now stating that uh, this pope and the Vatican is evil. This pope is an evil. He's opened the door. Now, why isn't the door open to ask any of these politicians the same question? What does the Vatican have to do with our political, uh, our, you know, our national security as well as what do they have to do with our foreign policy and our domestic policy, are they involved at all? You never hear them. Why? What's going on with that? And you're from your players, yeah. The, the only one who has asked that question actually and answered it is Trump. Because if you remember, during the primary season, he got a papal denunciation. Pope That's, denounced him. It's right. Yeah. And, and the Pope denounced Trump, and, and what did Trump do? He denounced the Pope. So. He has been the only politician to ever get a papal denunciation and then, uh, you know, give back as good as he got. And and the reason for that, of course, is one of the uh, major uh, planks, if you will, of the Catholic Church's platform is to welcome refugees and immigrants, illegal and legal, to the United States. And the biggest purveyor of refugee, in fact, the biggest organization that gets money for assisting refugees and immigrants is Catholic Charities, which is a branch of the Catholic Church, you know, so uh, yeah. they, they have a really big stake in the immigration and refugee business, I mean, that is, and it hands down that the Vatican supports that. Um, yeah, so I was they, talking they, uh, to somebody in Rome about that, because refugees are pouring into Italy, just like they are in Germany and, uh, and elsewhere, and the Vatican gets a good chunk of money for the refugees that are coming into that country. That, that's correct. In mm -hmm. fact, the uh, people, the uh, Catholic Church is responsible largely for bringing that influx of mainly African refugees into Italy um, by by uh, profiting from it. They, they actually they profit from it. Mm -hmm. So it is a business arm of the Catholic Church. Um, do they really think they're going to turn these people into parishioners? I don't know, but they, they seem to be heavily mm -hmm. invested in immigration, both in the United States and Europe. Hey, listen, we got to hold that thought because we got to take a break right now. And uh, let me just say this, that we're going to come back, continue a little bit on the, uh, talk about the elections a bit. And then, John, I want to get into what's going on in the Ukraine and talk a little bit about the Clinton Foundation. And we're going to do that all in the uh, second half hour here on the Investigative Journal. Go to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can get these shows. They've played, they put the archives up. If you can't get it live, and go back to all my shows with John, you're going to find some really interesting things that you never knew about the Vatican. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. For all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. My guest is Attorney John Levy. And, John, you know, we were talking about the elections, but let's just shift gears here for a minute, and we'll come back to that. But you had some things uh, you wanted to talk about the Ukraine, and maybe some of the things that connect to the Clinton Foundation. Was that what you were getting at? Absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's very important for your listeners to understand what's going on there. One, one of the major themes of the uh, Clinton campaign Besides that, the, the, the Obama theme that, that Trump is unfit is that because everybody knows they claim Trump is a puppet of Putin, right? right? Uh, they, what do they base that on? Well, uh, Trump has expressed some admiration. Uh, Putin, Putin, by the way, radically elected and is very popular, and. Uh, so you can't deny that, but then, you know, the Democrats come by and say, oh, Trump has um, endorsed a murderer and a, and, a, and a dictator, which is not the case. And you know, say, where did he get that from? Well, look what he's done in Ukraine. You know, Putin has invaded the innocent country of Ukraine and butchered people, and how can Trump say that? Mm-hmm. You know, well, of course, the, the story is, of course, a little different, and I've done some work in that area. So but what we had there was essentially a U.S.-supported coup d'etat, about three years ago, took out the uh, the neutral president of uh, Ukraine, Yanukovych, installed a uh, U.S.-backed government, which is still in there today. And then uh, Russia, protecting itself, um, did take over the Crimea Peninsula, where, where they were overwhelmingly backed by 90% of the population to protect its naval bases there. And then the um, Ukrainian government, CIA payback government declared sort of a war on Russian speakers in Ukraine, and the uh, the uh, Russia the provinces where people spoke Russian um, rebelled, and uh, Putin tried to prevent a slaughter of what occurred. But what people is what was Hillary Clinton 
uh, place in all that. Besides being Secretary of State, you know, encouraging the... Yeah, John, the if you could, party. just a second, stay close to that mic, because you're cutting out just a bit. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Hi, it's Hillary Clinton encouraging the uh, overthrow of the uh, lead. Right. What people don't know is that the large to the Clinton Foundation of all times is not the Saudis. It's, it's not the Saudis. It's a Ukrainian oligarch by the name of Viktor Pinchuk. Yeah, Pinchuk. He's name. Have you ever heard of him? No, no. Go ahead. Now, Pinchuk, he's worth about a million dollars. He's a Ukrainian oligarch, son-in-law of the former Ukrainian president, Kuchma, um, and uh, who was the guy who started the nation over Ukraine, where they started bringing stuff. The largest donor, he's personal friends with Bill Clinton. Um, of course, of course, he's going to be pro-Ukrainian. She will get us into a war over there. I, I, I'm convinced. And, uh, you know, she's already insulted Putin to, to the point of no return. I mean, her response to the Russian actions in Ukraine was to do what? She called Putin Putler, which, which if you know anything about uh, uh, Russia, the most, the most, uh, the worst insult you can say to a Russian is to call him a Nazi or Hitler. And that's so, that. Hitler, <laughs> Hitler. I mean, she, she insulted the man, and um, you know, there, there's no love lost between those two. And clearly, we'll have a war there on Europe's doorstep. Hillary Clinton's in there. She will arm the Ukraine, which is run by a bunch of fascist uh, thugs at this point, and you, you'll have a you know a recreation of the Second World War over there. Now, do you think uh, now? Do you think that uh, if we wouldn't have uh, backed that coup, that Put, that Putin wouldn't have went into Crimea? But no, he wouldn't have had any reason to. The, the only reason he went in there was because actually the Crimean people themselves who had an autonomous government um, based on a previous arrangement from the 90s because they had tried to secede once before because the people who lived there were not Ukrainian. They were Russians. Um, and nothing would have happened as long as the uh, you know democratically elected president of Ukraine had stayed in office. Mm-hmm. Um, nor would the eastern part of the country have seceded because that was the power base for the, uh, the guy who was in office. So you think, how much money do you think that, that uh, oligarch has given to the Clinton Foundation? Right. Well, it's, he's not only the largest donor to the Clinton Foundation, but according to Newsweek magazine, which is hardly, you know, info wars, right? Newsweek, left-wing magazine. Newsweek says $8 million in cash and promises of another $20 million or so. And, uh, this guy Pinchuk is also the single largest donor to the Tony Blair Foundation, which is sort of a English franchise of the Clinton Foundation. Now, can we can we go a step farther and show that he's gotten any special favors? Well, uh, sure, he has unprecedented access to Bill Clinton. He's <laughs> Bill Clinton's skiing buddy, and, and of course, they both like to collect modern art. You see, they, they do, and they they've had. He's throwing a birthday party, and they go to each other's birthday parties. But that's what those oligarchs do. Howl well, around again. Well, you know what's like it, oligarch rat pack. You know what's interesting, and I I've I mentioned this the other day. We've we've heard so much about this email email scandal of Hillary Clinton, and that's really important. And I mean, she should be indicted for what she's done. Uh, many people have for doing far less. But could it be that? She wants this to be front and center to cover up the real crimes in the Clinton uh, Foundation and all the money they've collected for special favors given to people? Well, I think they're connected at the hip, actually, Greg, because the mis- remember, there's, what, 30,000 missing emails? Remember, Donald, right. Donald Trump is a traitor because he said if the Russians have those emails, they should release them. Mm-hmm. That was one of the, it's another allegation against Trump. Oh, he's encouraging them to steal our secrets. No, he's not. He's saying if they have them, they should release them because Trump knows. But we know also that those missing emails are the most incriminating ones of all, ones that were allegedly lost on the Blackberries, the, you know, the 12 missing Blackberry devices, and the, 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 the stuff that was erased and lost. And those are the ones that probably show all the connections to the Clinton Foundation, which 
was the pay-for-play stuff. Well, we already know that out of her schedule at the uh, State Department, at least half the people that got access to her were Clinton Foundation donors. <laughs> yeah, and so here we go. And uh, you know what I, I was thinking? The one thing that, that scares me, if she gets into office and she she's ill, as, as uh, and if they can just prop her up long enough to get elected, who do you think is going to run this country behind the scenes? I think it would be the first man, Bill Clinton. <laughs> oh, no, it would be a combination of Bill Clinton and Obama and whoever is the money behind them, probably Silicon Valley people, you know, and the, and the uh, LGBT, you know, mafia and all the rest of them would be in there as well. I mean, the people who have turned the uh, armed forces into a diversity department instead of a defense department. So that, that, that'll that be occurring. And, uh, you know, so it, 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 that's going to occur whether she's uh, um, in office or dead, either way. Yeah, and look who's the vice president. He's a he's a he's a Jesuit if I've ever seen one. <laughs> well, he's a non-entity, just a placeholder. As I say, the real power in a future administration of her would be Bill Clinton and Obama. Obama's not going anywhere. He's a young man. Plus, and, he's staying in Washington. By the way, he's renting a house there. He said. So I'm he's serious. yeah. <laughs> Most yeah, presidents take serious, off and they go back home. Golden. Yeah, and that roster of big donors from Silicon Valley who want to uh, change how we uh, do everything. Exactly, and if Obama wanted to go home, I don't think he'd want to go to Chicago. There's more people getting killed there than on the battlefield in uh, in Iraq right now. Oh, no, they, they have a global... I mean, they make no... There's no secret about it. There's a global agenda. I mean, we just be honest about these things. Yeah, and, and you know, in fact... They, they uh, benefit. Yeah, another interesting thing. Yeah. The first presidential nominee I've ever heard say this, and Trump has said it. He said, I'm not a globalist. I'm an, a person that puts America first. So he's actually putting it out there for us. And well, well, Trump, Trump's amazing. I mean, not only is he not a globalist, he's not a Republican neocon either. In fact, Trump, I have to give Trump credit. And you have to say, look, who's, is Hillary denounced George Bush? No, Trump did, though. Trump said George Bush was a lousy president. Like, <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you ever expect to see a quote-unquote Republican nominee say that? No, I mean, Trump is the anti-Republican. And that's why people are going to vote for him. They're going to vote against the two-party swindle. And you know the interesting thing, if the fix isn't in for the, at the polls, uh, I've talked to people that go to these rallies, both rallies, Trump and Clinton, and they say when they go to a Clinton rally, there's just a handful of people. And when you go to one in Trump, no matter where he goes, tens of thousands of people are waiting to get in. Now, that has That's to right. translate into something, doesn't it? It does. I went to a Trump rally when he was in the primary, when he came out here to South Carolina. It was just amazing. They had to turn away 3,000 people at the door. Exactly. Um, they didn't have enough seats for him, and, and the man worked the room. I mean, it was amazing. It was like a, it was it was like a traveling road show. It was it was great. Um, so there's a lot of excitement there. I think well, the problem we have is that both the Democrat and Republican Party fear Trump, and there's there's a lot of people in our political system that are thinking up 24 hours a day. Is, uh, they're, they're thinking of 24 hours a day ways to derail a Trump victory. Yeah, and that's on both and sides of the aisle. Night, yeah, on both sides of the aisle. They're, 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 I, I've seen all sorts of trial. As a political scientist, I watch this stuff. I read the, you know, a basket of uh, newspapers, you know, the Wall Street uh, Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, and that's where they float their plans. So if you've been reading these newspapers the last uh, few weeks, you'll see them floating trial balloons. Like there'll be a, there'll be an article saying an op-ed saying, well. Remember, this is not a dead democracy. We have an electoral college, and there's no reason electors can't vote their own sense of sensibilities in these matters. <laughs> and, and constitutionally, that's what they're supposed to do. And anyone who says otherwise, it's unconstitutional. They'll, so they'll float that scenario out there. Or they'll float the scenario, if something were to happen to Hillary, um, can the election be postponed? Absolutely. President Obama or Congress can postpone the election to make it fair, right? Exactly. And then, you know. Yeah, and, and can can uh, Biden come in? Absolutely, absolutely, Biden could come in, but he needs more time to campaign. So they've been they've been floating all these various scenarios out there. So there might um, be a chance there's not going to be a November election, huh? 
Well, I'd give it 50-50 odds myself. I, I know I'm a little bit outspoken on that, but I think it's about a toss-up whether that, that election is going to come off or not. We've seen a lot of different... Remember, that there's the Russian hacking scenario they threw out there as a trial balloon also a couple of weeks ago. And we're forgetting about Julian Assange. (laughs) And we're forgetting about the October surprise with Julian Assange. Yeah, right, right. All kinds of things could could come out. We're going to have to cancel the elections, Greg, because of national security concerns. All those things can happen. And I think, like I said, 50-50 toss-up, that election isn't going to happen. I mean, when you have the sitting president of the United States, President Obama, declare that Trump is un fit for office. Well, I I think I don't think Obama was talking, uh, you know, off the cuff. I think he meant it. I think he believes it. I think he said, over my dead body, there'll be any Donald Trump in here. Yeah, he's and, he's, unfit. and he's and he's saying that on the. That. I'm getting a little feedback here, but anyway, are you there? I'm here. Okay. He's saying that not only in the White House, but he's saying it on the on when he's in foreign countries. I mean, that's unheard of. It's unheard of, and that would telegraph to me that there, they have a contingency plan for Trump getting elected, which is he isn't going to take office. Exactly. You know, I want to shift gears real quick and see if you heard about this story, and it's related to Iran. We all know about the four hundred million and the one point three billion sent in euros, uh, like in the dead of night, like drug dealers do, to pay off Iran, and to you, then that money being used. Uh, we know for terrorism and to to line the pockets of those people in Iran. I mean, it's the craziest deal I've ever seen in my life. But one day, it was last week, and this story, I was just, I was lucky to be listening to Fox News in the morning. And there was a story that, and a sen- one senator, I think it was on the Republican side of the aisle, was talking about, it's not only $1.7 billion, but we've proven, we've got facts that Obama has given them $33 billion over the last two years. Now, after I heard that, I said, wow, that's the biggest story I've ever heard. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. No one on either side of the aisle, Fox News hasn't talked about it. I checked the Internet out, and there was one story on it by this political group. Uh, I can't remember. It wasn't from any of the major uh, outlets. But that just disappeared, and I wondered if you heard about that. Yeah, I saw that story too, and I also saw that figure of thirty-two or thirty-three billion dollars, and I, I kind of took a double take and I said, "What?" Yeah, I, it is possible there were that many claims. There's U.S. claim means too that should have, you know. I also would say that that's a if there really was. Um, looking here, uh, the central is the source of that. Cent- Hold on for one second. Hold on for one okay. second. Okay, we're back. Uh, I had a little technical difficulty. John, did you see that thirty-three? That the story about the thirty-three billion. That, that's actually you're correct. That thirty-three billion. It actually it could be as much as fifty billion. It has to do with frozen assets. Um. Not just the cash, but other assets and things that were over the course of time. That that figure has been confirmed by both the Iranian period. Actually, the story goes back to much, much earlier in the year, in the January, as a matter of fact. The the end of sanctions, Voice of America, reading from them, end of sanctions unlocks $32 billion in assets. Now, that's incredible. I heard one senator say something in the morning, and that's all I heard about it. It went away. Right, but, but it's also assets that are not necessarily held by the U.S., but by other countries as well. Uh, so it isn't so just taxpayer able, money. It is, but of course the U.S., by taking the sanctions off, unlocked all those assets. So we may have given them only a $3 billion or whatever it is, and uh, but... Uh, they, as a net result, they get thirty to fifty billion from from other places. So wow, that is devastating. Action. I mean, that it, it appears yeah. it's all it's almost as if Obama's working with Iran against us. <laughs> it, it would appear that he should have a statue built in his honor. Of course, I don't know if they, they don't allow statues under radical Islam, but they should build a mosque in his honor over there in Tehran. 
called the Obama Mosque. That's the least that he could do. Now, besides the money, they've given them a fast track to to uh, to get nukes quicker than uh, <laughs> you know. What did they say? Ten or fifteen years out, they're going to have it oh, within a couple years. They just buy some now. They've got so much buy some from the Pakistanis, and they've got they've got money coming out their ears now. Why you would do that and destabilize the Middle East even further is beyond me. Yeah, and I mean, when we look at Iran, we've touched on that right now. But look at all the other countries. I mean, you just go up the line, Syria, Libya. Every time Clinton gets her nose into one of those countries, uh, it tears it apart, and we're going to be in a huge conflict somewhere down the line. The worst is yet to come, Greg. I mean, if Hillary gets in there, you have Saudi Arabia, Egypt. They, they tried to destroy Egypt, and luckily they, you know, the, the, the army took control and threw the Muslim Brotherhood out that Obama had put in. Uh, remember the remember the Muslim Brotherhood, the kindly yes. Democrat Muslim Brotherhood that wanted to kill all the Christians there. <laughs> um, so, and then Saudi Arabia by giving so, so, Saudi Arabia's arch enemy is Iran. So uh, Obama suddenly by opening the floodgates for billions of dollars to flow back to Iran just destabilized the entire Middle East created a counterbalance to the uh, Saudi Arabians who are supposedly our allies. Yeah, and every other day you're hearing how now they want to blow one of our, they, uh, they want to shoot down our airplanes, they want to, they come within 50, 100 yards of our ships, and Obama does not absolutely nothing. Well, well good. that's right. There, there is a nasty war. Syria overshadows it, but there's a very nasty war that's been going on between uh, Saudi and Iranian proxies in Yemen for the last couple of years. Huh. Almost as bad as Syria, and you can't keep up with it. I mean, <laughs> there's so much going on that you lose you lose track of that Yemen even exists anymore. Well, it, 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 essentially, what's going on in the Middle East is apocalyptic. I mean, we just the, the waves of migrants flowing into Europe, everything else. It's, it's an apocalypse waiting to happen over there, and only someone like Trump, I think, has a coherent policy, which is you go in, you tamp them out, and on the way out, you take their assets pump their oil out of there and say that this is payment for us having to go in there and restore the peace. Exactly. And, and you know what you know what the so called experts say about that? <laughs> what? He can't do that. That's against international law. He can't the army would be committing a war crime if it stole the oil <laughs> from the poor Syrians or Iraqis. You can't do that. I'm, I'm like carrying my I don't have any hair, but I'd be mean, had hair, I'd be tearing it out and going like what what? Yeah, it's a it's a war crime. What what about ISIS? What are they doing? That's a war crime. Why don't you do something about that? You're worried that you might steal some oil that belongs to a corrupt government in the Middle East to pay for to reimburse the taxpayers for restoring the peace. You know, that, that's easy things are under the current administration. Yeah, and then we 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 didn't even get into North Korea, and uh, <laughs> there's another powder keg ready to blow. You know. Well, it is, but actually, again, I, I like to give credit where credit's due. Trump's plan for North Korea, he said, the Russians and the Chinese can deal with it. But why, why are we concerned about that? Russia and China has a border with North Korea. Um, let them deal with it. Exactly. Good point. Not, not their interest that a crazy guy is lighting up nuclear bombs. You know, put the, put the last nail in the coffin. In uh, We have to look at Turkey. for we got about four, three minutes here. But that, to me, shows Obama's in uh, basically trying to destabilize this country because they were responsible, again, the U.S., responsible for the coup there, I believe. And they wanted to stabilize that country, turn it into a radical Islamic uh, powder keg again. And we got our military, that was our last hope. That was kind of a firewall, I thought, of to protect ourselves. Uh, we have our base there with nuclear weapons. What the heck's he doing in Turkey, too? I mean, it's yeah, so crazy. Our, our media didn't report it right, but actually the U.S. backed the, the Gulenists. Gulen right. is a radical Islamist. He's more radical than Erdogan. He's, he was the Islamic component that put Erdogan into power. So if you don't like Erdogan, you, would, <laughs> you surely wouldn't like Gulen, who is an even worse Islamist. And he's over here protected. He's living in the Pocono Mountains. <laughs> he is. And he, he was undoubtedly behind the coup. And undoubtedly the U.S. knows everything Gulen does. So um, why isn't he arrested? 
were uh, that I don't know. And all, all that's happened there is it's made a bad situation worse. It, it forced Erdogan to quickly make up with Putin. And that, that was the net result. Exactly. And then we our interests there are, are now destroyed almost. Because all Erdogan said was turn over, turn over uh, Gulen, who's the radical Islamist in your country that started all these charter schools in America as a front saying it's peaceful Muslims getting together. He's got over, using taxpayer money, by the way. Yeah, and you know what? The last statement, at first they said they were ignoring it. Then they said, well, publicly, we're going to turn them over, but it's going to take a while. We haven't heard anything since then, and that take a while is going to be forever because he'll never set foot in Turkey. No, oh, he, he's, he's our, for some reason, again, the, the crazed administration seems to think that supporting radical Islam against other radical Islamists like Erdogan, and certainly Erdogan's not moderate either, but by just stirring up trouble, somehow that's to our benefit. I, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah, and I gotta. I don't know what's going on with that military base, but uh, that's a real interesting story on Turkey. You know, John, we got about thirty seconds here. Uh, what's on your agenda? What cases uh, are you going? What's your your major thrust here in twenty seconds? <laughs> well, well, our big goal, of course, is the Vatican Bank case to try to wrap that up before the end of the year. Um, there are things happening over in the Balkans as well, so. Um, but we're always hoping for a break on that case because that's our main case we've been working in since 1999. That's what I always like to talk about. All right, and you know what? Maybe in a couple of weeks we'll come back uh, to see how the election process is going and also talk a little bit about some of the things you're doing in Africa, which we didn't have time for today. Hey, thanks for coming on the show, and we'll see you again, John. Okay, always a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Visit crosstheborder.org. C R O S S cross the border dot org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book. The rapture will be canceled. That's cross the border dot org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicholas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthe dot org.